I'm uh, Gustavo Turecki. I'm a clinician scientist, which means that I'm both a clinician that sees patient as well as I'm a scientist who works in the lab. Our cells, the way that they work is that they have uh, DNA, which is in their nucleus in the center of the cell. The DNA has the code for all the proteins and all the functioning of the cell. So the DNA has the code and the way this code is read is by the production of molecules known as RNA. So the RNA is produced um, based on the sequence of the DNA and then this RNA goes from the nucleus to the cytoplasm which is the part uh, outside of the nucleus but still within the cell where the proteins are produced and then generates a protein. Yes, so the DNA is where the code is, where's the RNA, it's sort of the um, way this code is interpreted uh, to produce proteins which is the end product of a cell. Over the last decades, what we've learned is that not all of the RNA actually produces proteins. So there is RNA that does not code for proteins, yes, and that so it's referred to as non-coding non RNA because it does not code for a protein. The non-coding RNA can be of different sizes, yes, um, and it's typically divided as small non-coding RNA or long non-coding RNA. The small non-coding RNA can be of different subtypes. MicroRNAs is one of the subtypes of small non-coding RNA. And what it does, typically, it targets a molecule of RNA that produces protein, yet so of the coding RNAs, um, for destruction, or what it does it targets a molecule of RNA and prevents it. Yeah, it doesn't destroy it, but it prevents it from being read into a protein. It's very simple. We measure microRNA by counting. We don't see the molecules, but we can count them using different techniques. We can take all of the universe of molecules that we have, we sequence them, which is like reading them, yes? And then we count how many times we have a particular sequence. This was the objective of this study, was to uh, measure the microRNAs in the blood of patients with depression before the treatment and then after the treatment as well, yes, because by measuring after the treatment, we can decide whether the levels of this microRNA will increase or decrease and whether there is an association uh, with a response to that particular treatment. What we identified were, um, were a set of microRNAs, yes, that helped us uh, predict response to antidepressant treatment and also that changed, yes, according to the response to antidepressant treatment. You know, it gives us opportunities to first better understand the illness and also better understand what are the mechanisms, yes, that are related to the response to antidepressant. Based on this measure of the antidepressant, we may uh, be in a better position to decide to what treatment this patient is more likely to respond. It is uh, certainly important to think that microRNAs are but one source of information that should or may be considered when deciding treatment. It's not 
based exclusively, or it's unlikely that it's going to be exclusively based on these decisions, but it's certainly an important information to take into account. It is possible to think that microRNAs may be used as therapies for uh, depression and other illnesses as well. So either by packaging microRNAs themselves, you know, and then delivering them to patients um, as the same way we take a medicine today, or by uh, packaging molecules that would uh, interfere with the microRNAs. It's unlikely though that they would be that specific to one particular symptom. It is possible that one day by looking at um, microRNAs and possibly in conjunction with a number of other molecules we may be able to um, have a better understanding of if not specific symptoms, perhaps a cluster of symptoms um, uh, of uh, patients that are depressed. Now the brain is made of cells. The cells have components, including genes, including uh, regulators of the function of the genes. Among these regulators are microRNAs, yes? so. MicroNase per se, yes, they don't tell you the whole story, but if you think about MicroNase in the context of how our brain works, yes, that ultimately is the organ that um, malfunctions when we are depressed. So then, yes, you know, it's important uh, to think about MicroNase as possible targets of treatments, as well as possible explanations of why is that we are depressed. The first area of medicine that, um, that started working with microRNAs and uh, identified changes of microRNAs was, uh, you know, it's cancer. So uh, today microRNAs have been uh, investigated in a um, large number of different uh, pathologies, uh, diseases of all kinds. So they're not specific to uh, depression or to mental um, illness. They are um, molecules that are involved in the normal function and possibly dysfunction of a number of different illnesses of our body. Methylation changes, which are changes at the DNA level. Uh, we're studying as well changes at the level of how the other non-coding RNAs, in addition to microRNAs, such as norRNAs and pWRNAs, and um, trying to identify how all of these, you know, would help us better understand those that respond and understand processes uh, related to response. Depression, yes, is a complex disorder and for which there's not a single treatment that helps everybody. We need to develop uh, additional treatments, yes, for patients who today don't respond to any of the treatments available. We need to better understand why is that people become depressed, um, where in the brain and where uh, are the problems exactly, and what actually works well Yes, for different types of depression. So there's a lot to learn about. And so research is essential because at the end, patients who are depressed are patients who suffer tremendously. Yes, so if there was a way for us to help them decrease the level of suffering, you know, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs>